Okay, I believe we are live. So welcome everybody to episode 46. Uh-oh. I knew it. Problems already. How do I turn that off? How did I knew this was going to happen? Okay, I believe oh. we are live. I'm an idiot. That was YouTube. So yeah, I was going to say, it's been an awful long time since I've done one of these. And it's actually back to the very beginning where I was super nervous. And uh, everybody knows my fear of public speaking. And uh, it's been so long. There's a lot of this that looks pretty unfamiliar. So first thing that we need to do, of course, is make sure that in the chat section, you tell me if you can hear me, if the sound is decent, if you need me to turn it up a little bit. Uh, that would be very helpful because... Uh, if you can't hear me, we can't really do the stream. So give me a heads up. And then uh, as we wait for a few people to roll in, I just want to highlight a few of the recent things that we've done in case these, you know, catch your ear and you think you might be interested. I did a recent video, my first video of the year. So maybe check that one out. It was basically talking about how 2022 was an absolutely terrible year, of course, especially for diversified portfolios where you've got stocks, bonds, and real estate, utilities, pretty much everything was down. So that's talking about that. And then I gave a little bit of a warning on maybe not over-optimizing for such a bad year. Kind of just, if possible, just let it go. Hopefully everybody survived, but you really do have to let it go and move forward because it does happen to pretty much everybody. So you can check that one out if interested. And then a couple of articles recently you might be interested in. The VXX, remember that Barclays suspended share creation and caused all kinds of mess. We couldn't trade it for months, but I've basically deemed it ready for trading again. The options are fine. So you can read that article. I went over the reasons why it's it's good to go if you're ready to go back from the UVXY back over the VXX. And then the last one I did a little update on our UVXY broken wing butterfly strategy called volatility trend and why it performed reasonably well last year in a bad year. So check those out if you are interested. Let's talk about the rundown. So it is a new year. Happy new year to everybody out there. Like I said, hopefully you survived last year and you're still smiling, but I'm going to get out my crystal ball here and I'm going to make a few predictions just for fun, but I'm also going to make them practical and try to tie it into how it might help you with your investing and help you with your business, perhaps. So I'll make three economic sort of market related predictions, and then I will make three social predictions kind of for fun as well. But I think it would be very helpful for people to know that these things are kind of on the horizon. So we will do that. And then, of course, the Q&A. So you can start asking your questions now. Likely there won't be very many people here because the YouTube algorithm favors consistency and people who upload a couple times a week, obviously the advertising dollars get shifted over there. So there probably isn't very, very many of you and probably get a good opportunity to get your questions answered. We'll probably get through all of them. So for however many few of you are here, please give the video a thumbs up for me. It would help get back into the algorithm's good graces. It would probably take me a few weeks. I'm going to maybe upload a couple of times a week for a few weeks, and we'll see if it can start to recognize that I'm back. So apologies for the long delay, but let's get started. So again, give the video a like for me, and let's get into my predictions. So economic prediction number one. Not sure that this is going to be super surprising, but I do believe the Fed will cut interest rates in Q4 of this year, so 2023. Right now, we're looking at the Fed funds rate here. You can see it was obviously much higher in the past. This is the financial crisis cut off there, and we basically had zero rates for most of it. You can see all of these rate decisions here, and this has basically been the most aggressive rate increase cycle that we've ever seen. You can see there's seven of them. So I actually believe because, of course, this is all induced by the high inflation and the fears of just out-of-control hyperinflation. They're basically going on full tilt for rate hikes. And I actually believe the Fed probably wants to reverse that. We've seen a couple of decent inflation prints in the last couple. So I think it's, I mean, it's certainly very far from good, but it's, from their perspective, heading in the right direction. 
Obviously, the Fed loves easy money. The governments love it. Basically, most people actually enjoy that and want to see rates go. But they can't just reverse course right away. So I think what they will probably do, they'll probably try to pace themselves a little bit. I think that I should actually check to see if I'm screen sharing. Anybody who's followed my live streams for a while, you know that um, I make that mistake pretty much every time I do this. So looks like we're good to go. Um, yeah, I, I believe that February cycle, they're probably going to have to do something. The market expects that. But then I think they will move towards trying to get back to more quarterly decisions. So what I mean by that is, if you look back here on almost all of these decisions before this year, they tend to do them in the March, June, September, or December cycle. That's what the market sort of expects. You can see first rate hike since the financial crisis, another one the very next year in 2016, and then March, June, December, and then in 2018, March, June, September, December, kind of on that every, four, every three month cycle. And then you can see it's also consistent here. COVID is really when things went a little crazy. They had to do emergency hikes or cuts basically within a few weeks. It was, it was pretty surprising. And then now recently, they're not on the quarterly cycle. March, June, March, May, June, July, September, November, December. That is an awful lot of rate hikes. So what I think they will probably end up doing is signaling in the February meeting that they're going to start to go back to more quarterly, occasional rate decisions. And as far as what those decisions will be, this is just my personal prediction. But I do believe that they will probably do either a 50 or a 25. That'll be the last sort of larger one that we have potential of getting. And then they might sort of start phasing it down. Probably in the September meeting, they're probably going to want to do a zero somewhere. So February will be one of these. Got June, September might be a zero. And then, of course, December, or no, February, March, June, September, December. They will be cutting by the end of the year. So like I said, February, it's kind of priced in. They're going to have to do something. And then they're going to go to quarterlies. So what you're looking at here, this is just the rate probabilities. This is the market's expectation. We're looking at 57% of the people out there think that it'll be a 25 basis point rate hike. And there's still a decent percentage of people who think it'll be a 50. So it's going to be one of those. But I would expect this is the last one. Now, as far as practical applications, for us, personally, in the VTS community, this is today's email. And the reason that these rate hikes and the potential cuts are important for investors, and specifically for us, for sure, is we've got all the volatility data, the you know volatility ETP data and all that stuff. But if we scroll down to our strategies, we've got five at 20% each. And two of these strategies are actually going to be specific to this rate stuff. So the first strategy not going to be affected no matter what, but we've got tactical balance that rotates between stocks, which is the Dow Jones two times leveraged, cash or gold. This is where high volatility. So as we move towards the higher risk in the market, we will be phasing out of our equity positions and moving towards what we consider safety positions. Now, of course, last year, the safety positions didn't really help very much, but you can see this one says cash. Usually, and for the previous 10 straight years, this was treasuries. It was bonds, either the IEF, which is 7 to 10 year, or the TLT, which from about 2012 to maybe 2015, I was using TLT. This will switch back. So as soon as the Fed signals that this is kind of it and they're going to be waning down, remember, there's always an inverse relationship between bond returns and interest rates. So if interest rates are going up, it's no longer advantageous to be holding bond funds, like the TLT, for example. If I go to here, you can see last year, the TLT, 20-year treasuries, had its worst year ever. So not much reason to be holding treasuries if the Fed is set on keeping rates going, keep rate hikes coming. But as soon as they signal a switch, for us in the VTS community, we can probably consider replacing this back to the 7 to 10-year treasuries and maybe take advantage of what would perhaps in the future, once again, become a safety position. And then the strategic tail risk, kind of the same thing. Two times S&P 500 when volatility is very low and stable and the market is calm. And then we will filter towards other things. This cash position for all of the previous years was an asset class. Now, recently in the last couple of years, this is IYR, the real estate ETF, which does have a somewhat strong correlation to interest rates. 
And that's why this is now cash. And it was very beneficial last year because we were in cash for a pretty good chunk of it in this strategy. And it didn't get completely killed. Of course, long volatility, but again, volatility didn't spike to extreme levels last year. So we didn't really get into any long volatility. But the point is, this is actually important. It's not just a, hey, let's see what happens with the Fed. This is actually going to directly impact our investing. So I do believe that rate cuts are on our horizon. When that happens, VTS community, we will switch up our strategies just a little bit and hopefully have some safety positions returned to the portfolio. Some coffee here. All right, economic prediction number two. Now, I know that a lot of people are homeowners. They might not like this, but in my personal opinion, I think that real home prices will continue to fall. So they're not as of yet. You can see here, this is residential properties. We are pretty much at a high here. But if we look at what's happening, if we look at a long-term trend line, you can see that it basically over and under corrects through history and follows this somewhat shallow upward sloping line. Remember, this is real rates. So for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about real, we're talking about the nominal home price, which is just the dollar value of a home. Let's say it's a $500,000 home. That's the dollar value, but it's inflation adjusted. So if your 500,000 home goes up to say 550,000 next year, you might think, wow, my home went up 10%. But of course, if inflation is up 10%, then you didn't really increase the value at all. That's what real home prices mean. And there's a lot of people out there actually think that, that over time their homes are making a lot of money. But in fact, what's end up happening, a pretty big chunk of that, in fact, almost all of it is inflation. So, you know, you hear this all the time. People say, hey, I paid 150 grand for my house. It's worth 500 now. I made a huge profit, right? Home ownership's incredible. Look at all the money I made. Well, I'll get to this in a second with the chat G GPT. But if we ask our new artificial intelligence machine, chat GPT, what the home price appreciation has been. Since 1970, you can see it spit out a number of 3.3% per year. Now, a lot of the data that I've seen ranges between three and four, but even if it's 4%, that's what home appreciation is going up each and every year. But that, on average, of course, it fluctuates. But that is a nominal number. That is just dollar value. We can also say how much was inflation over the same period. Since 1970, the same date. Inflation, our AI friend here says it's 3.8. Pretty accurate number, pretty close there. So the point being that actually inflation is just as high as the home price appreciation. So when you're talking about home prices, you know, the situation where people think they're making all this money, they're actually not, it's just inflation. And then you also have to factor in property tax, maintenance, insurance. If you move a few times, those fees can be, you know, three to 6% per time. So you end up with a situation where real home prices are probably not going to be appreciating a whole lot. So another thing that's gonna enter this equation, if we go to here and we go to a little mortgage calculator, what we can see, and this is kind of surprising, I don't know if people have played around with this or in fact had the bad luck of getting into a house and realizing the numbers, but let's say you took out a $500,000 or a $400,000 mortgage, 500 grand, you put down 20%. Well, a year or two, the mortgage rate was about 3%. So you're talking about a person owing 1,600, maybe 1,700 bucks a month, plus a bunch of stuff that you can't avoid that just comes with home ownership, but a $1,700 payment at a 3% mortgage rate. Fantastic, okay? And the amortization, you're basically paying 200,000 extra in insurance over the life of that mortgage. So pretty good situation to be in. But what if you were in a situation where now the mortgage rate is 6.5%? Well, now, that same person that was paying $1,700 is now paying over $2,500 a month on that mortgage. And as we know, a lot of people, hopefully not everybody, but there are people out there that stretch their budget pretty close and they kind of get that level where, hey, if I can just get a little bigger house, get that extra bedroom, whatever it is, they're kind of stretching their budget as it is. An extra $800 a month is actually quite a bit. Amortization schedule, now it's up to $510,000. So the first person a year ago was paying an extra 210 over the 30-year mortgage. 
this person's paying 510, so an extra $300,000 on that home. Obviously, that is going to have a major impact on home ownership, the value of homes going forward. So I would say practical application. Again, I don't want to get into the, hey, this is, um, you know, this is investment advice. It certainly isn't. But um, if it was me, if it was my money, and I was saying, look, when is the highest probability that you are going to get into a home with a decent price? I would say, again, for me, this is not investment advice, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to give it a little bit of time. I wouldn't be surprised if, let's say, over the next, I don't know, four or five years, we start seeing this number, which is extremely high right now, we start to see that drop. And remember, we are talking about real values. So there are a lot of people who are saying, oh, you know, you're crazy. It's, it's definitely not going to drop 30%, right? My home value right now is, say your home's worth 500 grand. I'm not actually saying that your home is going to go from 500,000 down to 400 or something, 350. I'm not saying that. It might. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's on the table. But what we are saying is that inflation's 8 or 9% a year right now. And that's the official government number. I mean, imagine what it actually is. So you're talking about a situation where if that $500,000 home three years from now is still $500,000, but you're compounding geometrically 8 to 10% inflation for three years, yeah, your home lost 30% of its value. And you might not see it because the dollar value is the same, but remember everything in the investment world and the economy has to be inflation adjusted, right? So that's basically what we're talking about. I think that's happening now. And I think it's going to continue. I would not be surprised if it drops. So again, like I said, practically speaking, not investment advice, but now isn't a great time to buy a home in my humble opinion. Third economic prediction. The recession, some of you are going to be like, well, yeah, of course. That's stupid to even say it. But the truth is a lot of people are thinking we're not in a recession. So my prediction is in 2023, the recession in the U.S. will basically be official, generally accepted, not only by the average person out there, but also by the government, and also, of course, importantly, by the official, you know, NBER that basically decides these things. So that's what I think. Again, we'll get back to our chat GPT in a minute here when I go about the social changes. But if you ask this, how do you determine what is in a recession? How do we determine the U.S. economy? Of course, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. The first, and this is basically what everybody knows, if you've ever taken a basic economics course, first thing they'll tell you is two consecutive quarters of real GDP growth. You can see here, this is real GDP. And we have declined two straight quarters in real GDP. So technically, by everybody's basic definition, that is already a recession. But of course, it's not good for voters. It's not good for elections. It's certainly not good for you know, optics and all that. So they're not going to admit it until it's actually just painfully obvious that, yeah, everybody knows. And it's actually a little weird that they're not saying it. That's the point where they're going to determine it. But of course, there are ways to spin this in the media, say, oh, well, that's actually employment. It's actually consumer sentiment, industrial production. There's a lot more to it than just negative real GDP, which really... I mean, when you think about it, real GDP is what all of that package together means. So it's kind of a shell game there, but let's go through some of the things that they are going to be, that I personally believe the data is going to deteriorate a little bit, maybe not catastrophically. I'm not predicting a, like doom and gloom here, but a few things. So I do believe that real GDP will sort of be trading on and off with positive and negative prints. I, I just don't think the economy is going to be very strong for a couple of years. And we could see that quite regularly. The next one, of course, the big one that everybody would talk about is unemployment. And unemployment right now, it is low. 3.7% is what you would call full employment. And you could say, wow, it's a screaming economy. It's doing fantastic. I think one thing that is a little bit unclear for some people out there, and if you know this, you know, I don't want to sound condescending, but you have to remember that the employment, the unemployment rate, 3.7%, isn't saying that 96.3% of the economy and the Americans have jobs. It's not like only 3.7% of people don't. Unemployment means you are willing and able to work, but you can't find a job. That's what the unemployment rate means. 
So it's actually a little bit deceiving to say that while unemployment is so low, that means the economy is incredibly good. It might be. I mean, it, it could be. But it could also be a function of not a whole lot of people looking for jobs, right? Not a whole lot of people working. The unemployment rate could be incredibly low, but that doesn't necessarily mean the economy is strong. You can see the current labor force participation rate is at 62%, slightly better than, of course, the COVID bottom when everybody was losing their jobs. But this is bad. I mean, the economy is not what you would call firing on all cylinders here, employment-wise. And you have to remember, too, that a lot of these people that do have jobs, it doesn't actually say anything about the quality of the job. There's a lot of people who, we'll get to it in a second, but wages, it's not the job that they want, but they've technically got one. Maybe they've got two part-time jobs and that's counting somehow. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, only 3.7% of people don't have their dream job. That's not what it is. So this is the thing that bugs a lot of people too, is when the government, and I heard the Biden administration put this out recently, that hourly wage growth is just consistently rising, right? Every administration, Republicans say it during their four or eight year period, Democrats say it when they're in power. They always say that wages are always constantly growing. The economy is doing fantastic. And technically, again, correct. However, just like with the real estate problem, nominal versus real. If you look at the nominal wage growth, yeah, everything looks great. But if you adjust for inflation, now you can see that actually wages on a real perspective adjusted for inflation, they're basically stagnant for quite a number of years. I mean, some years it spikes up. This is actually just bad data print. Of course, the COVID problem makes things seem a little bit different than they actually are. But I suspect that the um, real wage growth is not going to look tremendous in the next few years. Not that it ever really did. For our sort of the last 20 years, it hasn't been great. But nominally, it gives the government data to say, hey, look at how great our policies are. Everybody's making more and more money every year. Well, are they? I don't know. And, and again, that's circle back again. This is based on the official government numbers of inflation at eight or 9%. I, I, I think it's crazy that it's, it, they don't just come out and say it's 15, it's 15 at least. So actually real wages are dropping pretty substantially. What else did I miss one? Real median household income. Okay. Again, this is going up, but falling over a little bit. Now, if you're interested, of course, this is household income, so it includes two family homes. And I, I believe in the US, I don't know, something like 70% of homes are qualified as that, 60 or 70. If you look at the individual median, remember median is the exact 50th percentile. So half of Americans make more than 46,000 and half make less than 46,000. But I think this is gonna fall over as well a little bit. That's not great. Consumer debt, service payments, this is very important. Because again, the nominal value of debt that a person has isn't nearly as important as how much it actually costs to service that debt. That's the number that you should be looking at, All right? If interest rates are at 2% and you've got massive credit card debt, it's not great. I'm not saying you should do that, but it's actually not as punishing. But if interest rates are rising as they are, then all of a sudden that debt that people have, now it's costing an awful lot to service that debt. So you can see we are obviously growing into a pretty extreme level and people are feeling burdened by the debt. This is obviously not good for an economy. We've got consumer sentiment, again, crashing. People are not very confident about the future. These are individuals. Businesses, not confident at all. What is this gonna do from a practical perspective? Well, if businesses are not confident, they're not gonna be hiring a bunch of employees, so the employment situation might get worse. They're also looking at rates that are rising. They're not gonna be investing into new R&D and expanding production and trying to ramp up their business. They're gonna be tightening the purse strings and trying to you know, reduce workforce whenever possible and cut expenses if necessary. That's kind of the cycle that we are in right now. Lastly, I'm sure you've all heard, you've seen YouTube videos at some point about the yield inversion. The US yield curve has been inverted for quite a while. Essentially what that means is, I can illustrate this for you here, investment related. Treasury, I mean, there's different duration of yields and treasuries and bonds. You can see it here. Under a normal situation, you would have the higher end ones, right? Longer term bonds paying a higher coupon rate than the shorter term bonds. That would make sense in a functional normal economy obviously. Um, but what we've got now, you can see the 
that chart was showing the two year. So it's 4.45. The 10 year is only 3.7. So shorter term bonds are actually paying more than longer term bonds right now. And it even goes down to three months, 4.6 compared to a 30 year at 3.78. This is not a healthy situation to be in. And essentially, as it says here in the red here, <clears throat> the yield curve inversion has predicted successfully seven out of seven of the last recessions. Now, it is important to note that it doesn't happen right away. There is an, on average, about a 12 to 15 month delay between the yield curve inversion and the eventual admission that we are in a recession. So it, it did invert a while back. So you could maybe expect that if this situation persists and we go eight for eight in the prediction power of the yield curve inversion, then yes, somewhere mid next year, I think it'll become pretty obvious that that's happening. So I, I don't really know the practical final lesson here. I don't know what it's gonna do to the markets. We have to remember that, you know, the old saying, the stock market is not the economy and the economy is not the stock market. This is true. Just because we go into a recession does not necessarily mean the stock market's going to have a down year. There are plenty of times, maybe not plenty, but certainly there are examples where the recession was there. Economy looked pretty miserable, but the stock market still can make positive gains. So certainly not saying that, um, you know, we're in for a terrible stock market. I don't know if you guys saw it. Scroll up to the top of the feed here. I put a poll. Maybe you can answer the poll there. Um, where you think the S&P 500 will be next year. Up, down, basically unchanged. Now, obviously a recession, maybe a depression if things get bad, that will increase the probability that the stock market's going to have a bad year. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that. And in fact, I remember doing an article maybe about three years ago, and I did the research on it, and it turned out that from the moment the yield curve inverts up until the recession is declared, which is an average of about 15 months, I believe, 15 or 16 if memory serves, the stock market was actually up 12% on average during that time period. So don't be overly surprised if the stock market does go up 5 or 10% in the time from a yield curve inversion up until the actual recession. It, it's actually the average. That's what happens most of the time. So kind of a lagging indicator there. But, you know, if, if we are to believe that we're going eight for eight here, this is, um, this is probably not good. So <clears throat> those are my three economic predictions. Like I said, um, practically speaking, might not, be, um, might not be the best time to buy a home, Practically speaking, we're probably still not in the clear to be using bond funds in our portfolios. Get those IEF and TLT positions down a little bit if you can, removed if possible. Unfortunately, there aren't that many replacements and safety positions, but um, do your best there. And then of course, I don't know, the recession. I hope everybody's content in their job and working hard and you know doing the best they can because, um, you know, I want everybody to survive and, and prosper if that happens. Recessions happen in the US, the average cycle is about six to seven years. And we can't have our lives collapse around us every time there's a recession. So hopefully people are making moves and really working hard and grinding it out, doing your side hustles, all the things that we talk about on my live streams. I hope everybody's doing those things. So grab some coffee here for the next topic. All right. Let's do three social predictions. Starting with number one, <clears throat> chat GPT and artificial intelligence will explode in 2023. So I don't know how many have actually been paying attention to this chat GPT stuff, but um, in my opinion, and I'm not a tech person, full disclosure, I'm not going to be one of the person that's leading the charge here. I'm not going to be introducing any radical artificial intelligence things. I don't actually think it's going to replace a whole lot of what we're doing. But in my opinion, if you're not taking it seriously, dedicating a little bit of time to figuring out what it is and how it could potentially be used, I think it might be a missed opportunity. And in a few years, because remember, technology travels fast. It, it improves quite quickly, especially AI. It's scary fast. If you're not taking it seriously, you might get left behind. I, I don't want to be too doom and gloom with that one because, of course, I still believe that 
human ingenuity and our creativity and the way we can plan things. I mean, we're always going to have a role in this and we're always going to have the primary role. Maybe not always, I don't know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, but certainly in, our, in the foreseeable future. We're not replacing humans, but there are a lot of things that you got to take this seriously. It's, it's happening. You're going to hear it all over the ne news next year. You're going to hear people talking about it. You're going to see courses pop up everywhere on teaching you how to handle it. And, you know, I'm a strong believer in education. I think that if you could pay a couple thousand dollars for education and use that, what you learn to amplify your future revenue, I mean, it, it pays for itself a hundred times if it's good quality education. So you might want to consider doing that, you know, for, you know, shameless plug, my options course that's coming, it's kind of the same concept. It might be a little bit of a hit up front, but what you could use that money and, and amplify it and compound it going forward I'm a strong believer in education, especially if you can do it without dropping 50 grand a year at a university, you know. So might want to consider jumping on some of these chat GPT AI courses, the Dolly thing. All, there's all kinds of them now, and they're going to be exploding. So if you don't know what it is, I'll just spend a couple of minutes here. Oh, nope, that's not it. Still rusty. If you don't know what chat GPT is, I'll just show you really quick. This is actually kind of cool. So... And again, I'm not a tech person, so <laughs> this is all kind of new to me in the last month as well. But essentially what this is, is an AI. It's an artificial intelligence where they've really made it easy to use. I don't have any coding experience. I don't know how to program anything. You know, I'm, I, I'm kind of a, what was that movie, uh, Ocean's Eleven, where they said uh, George Clooney and Brad Pitt's characters were analog players in a digital world. That, that's kind of what I am. I'm just... You know, I, I've got some skills and I certainly learn everything that I can to support my business and grow my strategies and make my investing as profitable as it can be. But I'm not pretending I'm some programmer here, but this is basically an artificial intelligence. So why don't we just ask chat GPT, let's say in the chat box here, you can just say, give me the top three practical uses for, for I'll just call it by name, chat GPT. All right, let's see what it says. So this is basically scanning. It has access to, I guess, essentially pretty much most of human civilization's data. And it's in real time going to spit something out for me. So it's telling me it can be used for customer service. Language models could be used to handle customer inquiries and, pro inquiries and prior answer questions. That sounds pretty cool. Chat GPT could be used to generate product descriptions, articles, or other written content. That's going to be important. Simulate conversation for language. That's going to be spooky when that hits. So this is what you can do. And then you can actually just have a conversation with this. You can say, um, I don't know, give me two more points. You can just ask it to do stuff. You can just talk to it just like you're a regular person there. And it'll say, okay, here's, here's a few more. And whatever you ask it to do, I can... I can turn it in and I can say, okay, that's great. Now make it funny, make it, make it an entertaining read. You can do all these things. You could say, let me wait till he's finished here. What did he say? Language translation. My wife and I were playing around with it today. It, it, it's Chinese is exceptional as well. It wasn't quite as good as the English, but it was on point. You could say, give me the same five points in bullet form. See what it does there. You can, you can understand the power of what's going on here, that you could essentially write things quite quickly. Now, one of the things that my wife kind of thought about, and I, I see a lot of people on the internet talking about this as well, their knee-jerk reaction is, isn't that just Google? Like, haven't we had this for 10 years, 20 years? All you're really doing is a Google search, and it kind of looks like it's this is a very important distinction to make. This is not Google. You have to understand that when you are doing a search, you are scouring the internet of work that has already been created. It's already out there and Google can point you in the right direction, but that's pretty much what Google is. It is a search engine. What this AI is doing is using all of that data and then in real time compiling it in the exact way that you tell it to. I know for a lot of people, it might seem like a very subtle difference, but this is quite literally game changing. This could very well be November, 2022,
could very well be one of the most pivotal times in human history. I'm not exaggerating at all. This is this is pretty serious. So I'll give you another example. This is kind of fun. So you can go to a new chat. Always go to a new chat. Don't confuse the system by layering everything over. But I'm shooting this on a Sony camera right now. And I don't know a whole lot about cameras. I just watched a few YouTube videos and I chose the one that my favorite YouTubers told me to go buy. But let's say that I'm a YouTuber and I'm actually doing product reviews. So um, write me a short uh, YouTube, oh, come on, typing, YouTube script describing the Sony A7S III camera and its functions. So let's say I'm a YouTuber and I wanted to do this and I, I need to put out a script and I got to shoot a video and I've only got a couple hours. I mean, I, I'm not sure it's going to be the perfect script. You can understand what's going on here is it's basically telling you the functions, it's searched the internet. But from here, from this basic level, you could actually make some improvements. You could, you know, when it's done spitting out all this information, honestly, you could just read this in a YouTube video and it wouldn't be that bad. This is a pretty decent script. You could, like I said, you can give it follow-up questions. Overall, the Sony a7S III is a top choice. Yes, it is. I love my camera. Good for you. Okay, finish typing. And then you could, again, you could, <laughs> I actually referenced it before, make it funny. It, it might actually type in some, some jokes or something. You know, you never know what's going to happen. This is an AI that basically is scouring the internet and it knows what people like and what they dislike and it knows the articles that get the most hits and it knows, you know, all the, the top content creators and it can read their articles and what they wrote and how, how many hundreds of thousands of views those YouTube videos got. It's basically able to do this in real time. Again, this is not Google. This is not just pointing me in the direction of something that's been done. This is writing it in real time. It's spooky. And it might be a subtle difference, but trust me, this is this is game changing. So I'll uh, I'll leave our friend Chat GPT alone here. But the point is, like I said, if you're not taking this seriously and you're not at least willing to dive in halfway and figure out a way that it could possibly improve your workflow, it could speed things up a little bit for you. It could, you know, m my work. It's this is probably not going to do hardly anything for me, to be honest, because my emails are very hyper-specific to my strategies. So it has to be me answering all my emails, all the strategy building and whatnot. This is all from my 17 years of investing experience. Certainly our friend chat there doesn't know what that's about. So this isn't going to do much for me, but there are a lot of people out there that you could imagine helping you write your emails, helping you scour for clients, helping you you know, streamline your workflows, all these things. Yeah. And then you can imagine it could get really spooky. So my prediction was 2023, it's going to explode. Let me give you an example. You start a YouTube channel and chat GPT is now writing your scripts, right? But it can go further than that because you can plug that script into a different program, an AI program, and you can tell it to read that script out loud in any human voice you want. You could make it a British woman, you could make it, you know, whatever you want, a, a deep voiced, you know, Morgan Freeman voice, if you want, whatever you want, then go further. You've seen the deep fakes, you've seen Tom Cruise and, you know, playing guitar and doing all these crazy things when it's not really Tom Cruise. Next year, you could see Tom Cruise has his own YouTube channel using deep fakes, doing all kinds of things that chat GPT wrote the script, another voice recognition program copied his voice. Crazy, crazy stuff. I, I would not be surprised if in a few years from now, some of the most popular content creators aren't even people. I mean, we really are going in that direction. So as you can tell, I'm excited for this stuff, but not because it's going to help me. My business is actually pretty hyper-specific to me, and it's, it's always going to need my brain to, to make it go forward. But I'll try to find some uses for it as well beyond just making Tom Cruise teach you about the Sony cameras. So that, that'd be pretty funny though. All right. Social prediction number two, TikTok will be banned in the US. And if it's not banned, I think there will at, at the very least, there's going to be a pretty strong push towards that. So I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm 47 years old. If you're anywhere near my age, you've probably seen this. This is kind of funny, but you know, 
social media, you could definitely make a case that um, all social medias now cross that threshold where it's all bad for us. It, it used to be good. It was pushing humanity forward. It was excellent for connecting people and helping our businesses, but it's really contributing to our brains turning into mush at this point. So that advertisement was basically in the 80s when I was growing up, they TV commercial comes on, they say, they show you an egg and they say, this is your brain. And then they smash it in a fry pan and they cook it up and they say, that's your brain on drugs. Any questions? And that was the advertisement. So I could say the same thing about TikTok right now. Show you the egg, this is your brain, fried up in the pan, that's your brain on TikTok. Any questions? So certainly you, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, there's a lot of garbage on there and a lot of degeneracy and a lot of things that are going to take us in a negative direction. But TikTok is out of this world terrible for people. I mean, the, the youth these days, their attention span is three seconds. If, I don't, if I'm making a video and I don't say something good within three or four seconds, or they don't see something flashing around or going across the screen, they're out. They're gone. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the curve of my videos and everybody's video, I've seen you know, people with millions of followers, it's brutal. You just, you've got to grab people immediately because these programs are now designed to, they can't even finish watching a 10 second TikTok and they're already scrolling to the next one. It's, it's really bad. And then you factor in the fact that it's Chinese and TikTok in China is not the same as TikTok here. TikTok in China is an educational thing. You can only access it an hour or two a day. It's, it's pretty good social media app, but in the, in America, it's just, you know, so you could make the conspiracy theory case that it's a Trojan horse. You know, the Chinese are looking to take down the American empire from the inside out. Not a bad idea. I mean, honestly, TikTok is just, it's the worst. It, it really is the worst. So practical application here, again, if you're a content creator, which I would always encourage people to do, create more content than you consume, I would say you might not want to focus on TikTok. I, I definitely think it's going to be the very first one on the chopping block. And it would not surprise me at all if within a year or two, TikTok's gone. So, and then I hope, and I wouldn't, I mean, I don't want the people who created it to lose their business and their money. And, you know, I don't want creators to lose their revenue stream either, but I think just net positive for society. We got to clean this social media stuff up. It's, the world is very, very quickly going to de degeneracy. So uh, not a fan. Lastly, our old buddy, Elon Musk, will step down as the CEO. And as I say, Twitter will still be Twitter. I don't actually think Twitter was that bad before. Um, and I don't think it's really changed much now. So I don't have a whole lot of people who were banned before and have brought, been brought back. So perhaps if you've got friends who were reinstituted, it probably is great for them. But to be honest, I think Elon Musk is wasting his time. And I think he could do a lot better with it. So Elon, in the next year or so, he's going to realize that Twitter is an ad business. That's what it is. You can call it whatever you want. You are subject to what the advertisers want you to do. The censorship and all that stuff, free speech, First Amendment, it's great. It's awesome. However, it is an ad business. If you're talking about Twitter, this is an ambitious number. I don't think it's quite that high, but Twitter has 400 million users, give or take. I don't know how active they are, but let's use that as a number. In 2021, Twitter earns $5 billion in revenue. Sounds like a pretty good number, right? Problem is 90% of it, it's actually 92%, was from advertising. So yeah, you're gonna pretty much, if you want those advertising dollars to continue to come in, you're going to have to start doing the same things that all the other social media companies are doing. Maybe not to that extreme level. I think you could easily make a case that it went way too far and the recent Twitter files that are coming out, it's, you know, there's a lot of things that you think, wow, that, you know, you guys kind of crossed the line. When I read the Twitter files, I thought, well, at the very least, you're watching two opposing opinions going back and forth for, in many cases, several weeks and months before they actually made these draconian decisions. But at least you saw two teams saying, well, I don't think we should do that. And the other team saying, yeah, ban them. And the other team's like, no, we shouldn't ban them. Eventually they did make the bad decisions but at least they were debating them internally. So that was probably good to see. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you want to charge $8 for people, last year, 0.2% of Twitter users were verified. How many people are gonna pay $8 to get verified when it doesn't really do anything for them? The blue check mark doesn't mean anything anymore. You can just buy one for eight bucks. So, I mean, 
Elon can have my $8. Currently, it's not available in Taiwan. And my Twitter is hooked up through, you know, my Taiwanese phone number. So I don't have the check mark, but I'll give him my eight bucks. I don't care. But it's not really going to put a dent in it. The fact of the matter remains Twitter is an ad business. So Elon and Musk is going to realize this. He's going to think, you know what? I'm kind of bogged down with this stuff. It's really not worth it. Reminds me, <clears throat> you guys know I'm a huge movie buff. So it popped into my head. You remember in the movie Goodwill Hunting? I'm aging myself a little bit, but that's one of the best movies ever made. Um, you know, when Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's character, and he says, basically, you know, you owe it to us to do this, right? If you're still here working construction 20 years from now, I'm going to kill you, right? You, this is beneath you. It's, you know, you're way beyond this. He was way too smart for that. That's what I think of Elon Musk. I think, I mean, do what you want. Great. You've got a lot of money. You can buy whatever company you want, but trying to solve the Twitter problem, if there even is one to begin with, because it was just an ad business and they were doing the best they could, this is beneath him. I mean, I actually like Elon Musk. I got criticized recently on Twitter for criticizing him too much. Somebody said, oh, I'm always bashing on him. No, not true. I actually like Elon Musk, but can you please go back to the things that we liked you for? I mean, Twitter is just, it's kind of beneath him, right? Tesla, I would never buy a Tesla. I'm still a child when it comes to cars. I need the V8, the roaring V12, but whatever. Tesla has done a lot of cool revolutionary things. Get back to that. SpaceX, I'm a huge geek when it comes to space exploration and, you know, rockets and all the, the NASA program. I, I've seen every single movie. I, I, I read the books. I read the Neil deGrasse Tyson books, all of the Einsteins. You know, I love that stuff. Get back to doing that. Do the Starlink. That's a great idea. Bring access to the internet. Make it a fair playing field for everybody. That's awesome. Neuralink, I'm a little bit hesitant to put something in my brain, but if it's medical related and he can help people with Alzheimer's and, you know, all these, you know, whatever diseases that people have, that would be fantastic. And of course, the end goal, multi-planetary. This guy, I actually said it on Twitter recently, that Elon Musk is well on his way to being stamped in history, just etched in history as one of the most pivotal people we have. And he's doing this every day, all day right now. He's got the Twitter fingers. I, I just think it's so far beneath him. And I really wish he gets back to pushing humanity forward. And, you know, Elon, you'll never watch my streams. But if somebody catches wind, I volunteer to go to Mars. I, I'm, I'm in. Send me. I'll go. It just, I love that stuff. So <laughs> maybe Elon can do some decent work with Twitter. I don't know. Maybe he'll put a slight dent in it. Probably not. It's massively in debt already. Um, can we just get one of the smartest, most revolutionary people we have away from the, the phone? You know, um, that's my opinion. So those are my predictions. Hopefully, um, maybe we'll catch them all. Maybe we'll get none of them, but, uh, just for fun, that was my crystal ball reading of what 2023 is going to bring. So agree, disagree, ask questions, yell at me, call me stupid. I love it all. Engage. I'll answer some questions, but uh, I suspect the Elon Musk one will get people, but I am not a hater. I actually, um, I like anybody who's doing great things for humanity. Whoever is responsible for that chat GPT thing, oh, that's... That's awesome. I love it. So um, sound is good. I'm just going to go through and try to fire off some of these if I can. Mark, good to see you. I know it's been a while since I've done streams. Thank you. Uh, it's been about four months, actually. That's way too long. Did I say 2021? Um, I think I wouldn't say that I predicted anything. I think a lot of us have been thinking that, wow, this bull market has been going on an awful long time. And there's been an awful lot of, you know, money printing. It's not technically money printing, but effectively, uh, bad Fed decisions, terrible government policy. So at some point, the party's going to end. So I don't know whether I predicted it. I certainly didn't um, navigate my entire portfolio to avoid it. I had my share of strategies that didn't do well either. So um, 2022 was not good for me. Fortunately, I'm a very heavy option trader. So Overall, things were pretty decent, but uh, no, I I didn't just say, hey, I'm not buying stocks, I'm going to cash. I didn't, I, I wish I did, but that would have been silly because you can never predict the future. You're always going to have one bad year in a, 
you know, 10 year window, it's, it happens. YouTube is work. It is work. People don't understand, but making, and I don't know if it's just because I suck at it, but uh, making a YouTube video, people would be surprised how, how much work it actually takes. It's roughly speaking, 10 hours. If it's a subject that I, I know reasonably well, and I've talked about it and prepared all the charts in advance, but sometimes it's something that, hey, I get a new idea and I actually have to go out and research it. That's another five hours, another 10 hours. So a video that where I've, if, if I'm talking about volatility trading or options trading, I can m make those in about 10 hours because basically it's all in my head and I just have to two, three hours to write a script, maybe an hour to set up all the cameras and shoot the video, maybe three, four hours to edit it and then another hour to upload it and do the SEO and figure out how to make a thumbnail, which I'm terrible at. It's about 10 hours, but I've spent 20 on videos before. YouTube is work. That is absolutely true. Okay, Kyle, it's looking like long-term historical interest rates highest in the past decade, but still lower than the 80s. Yeah, you got to remember too, though, that there's always that very tight relationship between, you know, wages, inflation, interest rates, right? These are kind of on a long-term time horizon, they're fairly inseparable. On short-term, they can deviate. But, you know, looking back in the 80s, you can say, wow, rates are actually pretty low right now. They're only 4.25%. Well, you got to remember that in the 80s, when interest rates were up at 16, 18, 20%, inflation was as well. So there's, there's always that balance. And wages were kind of the same as well. So you can't just compare nominal numbers head to head. You have to also compare the fact that, yeah, you you could get government bonds that were paying 12, 13% as well. So um, I think right now we are messed up the wrong way. Inflation is way higher than the government official numbers. And it's it's really crushing the, the average person. Whereas I don't think in the 70s and 80s, it was actually like that. I Not that it was a party. I remember my family had to move. My dad was in the oil industry and we had to actually move because of a lot of things that were happening in the 70s. I used to live in Houston when I was really young, when I was, you know, one years old. Um, and we moved to Canada. But I, I don't think it was quite like it is now. I, I think that the average person was still probably better off. The average working family was probably still better off, even though the nominal numbers look like that would have been just diabolical. It actually wasn't because the other things kind of balance it out a little bit. This is interesting. Because your shirt is black dots, the compression of video is very bad and it's blinking all the time. I'm also standing. I don't know if it's that because I'm, I got my standing desk. This is really changed. My back feels great. I could actually probably start golfing soon. So I stand for basically 10 hours a day on my computer. But that probably means that I'm moving more too. So yeah. I just put a shirt on. So there's actually a word for that. What is that called? When uh, there's a word for that. YouTubers warn you about that. Make sure you choose solid shirts. So good call. Thanks for that. Next time I will fix it. I don't have that many clothes though. As all of you know, I'm pretty much a minimalist. I, I have maybe five shirts. Sometimes I'll double up on them. So, you know, I've got more. I, I don't wear dirty clothes, but... If you ever see me on the street or, you know, sometimes people in coffee shops recognize me, um, I've got about four shirt rotation. So we'll, we'll see if we can fix that, but uh, not for today. And I'll try to not move so much. I am standing. I'm not having any problems with the video. Well, that's good. Good news. Some people might, some people might not, but I will um, rewatch it on the broadcast and see if I can switch my shirt. The demand for workers will remain high. The boomers are retiring out. We are on short. Yeah, you could make a case for that, but I think on aggregate is what's important. And short term is also what's important. I think long term, you're probably right that everything kind of cycles through and turns over. And certainly you've got a massive number of boomers retiring and we've got to somehow replenish them. But then again, you know, Chat GPT, AI, robotics, who knows how many jobs we're going to lose in the next five years. It could be rough. VIX has you lost. Well, fortunately for you, my friend, I have hundreds of videos, hundreds of articles, over a thousand articles, um, live streams, tune in, ask all your questions. I answer everything 
VIX related investing and personal questions. Ask me anything. Try to get me canceled. Um, but tune into the live streams. We'll get you straightened out. Uh, the VIX is a little bit confusing, but you got to remember that most people in the investing world are looking for easy. They're looking for quick. They're looking for putting in the least amount of work possible and get the most return back. So something like the VIX, something like the volatility products, the VIX futures term structure, all of these things that we talk about, they are complicated. But if you put in the work, there is reward in there. There, there is extra reward for investors who are looking to go that extra mile. If you just try a little bit, you're going to be ahead of 80% of people already. I mean, I don't want to hack on the modern generation too much, but if you're just a little bit aggressive and you just have a little bit of work ethic and you're willing to just, you know, get yourself a, a strong coffee and sit there for three hours and study, you're already going to be ahead of, boy, I don't even know how what percentage of the population. But um, that's like I always say with me, I mean, I'm, some people watching might think I'm smart. Some people might think this guy's an idiot. I don't know, but I know one thing's for sure. There's very few people that outwork me. So my success in my life through my professional golf career, through university, when I got the scholarships and I was always kind of that person that was succeeding, wasn't because I was smarter than anyone else. It's just, you're not going to outwork me. That's That's just it. So I would recommend people do the same. Just the VIX is complicated. There is a barrier to entry, but... Um, when you get over that, there's there's a lot of reward. Okay, are you aware of a new regulation withholding of publicly traded partnerships effective? Yes, I am. I'll finish off your questions here. The effect of this regulation is that since January 1st, non-US residents can no longer trade UVXY and IB blocks. Yeah, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a full video together talking about this. So you're absolutely right. There is, as of January 1st, non-US resident taxpayers are going to be subject to a 10% withholding, which is steep. That is a penalty. You do not want, it's not one of those things where you can just say, hey, you know, I'll just pay the 10%. That's, that's rate of return changing punishment. So obviously we're gonna have to circumvent that somehow. Now it doesn't really affect us very much. On the one hand, 77, I think, percent of my community are Americans. So for the 23% that aren't, this is not going to affect the ETNs because remember, there's a difference between an ETF and an ETN. The ETF, exchange traded fund, they actually hold the securities within the fund. And that's what the withholding is being paid on. So if you sell that ETF, you are essentially selling the futures or the commodities or whatever the ETF is structured around. An ETN, an exchange traded note, is basically just a promissory note. It's an IOU. It, it doesn't directly hold the securities within the fund. So it's not even a fund. It is literally quite an IOU. Now you are subject to the credit risk of the bank, but they are basically safe to trade, but they're not going to be subject to that. So VXX and VXZ are the two basically last men standing in the vol space that are still of ETN structure. And there actually are benefits to ETNs. So if a person wanted to hold it outright, you would probably want to default to that. Also, options are not going to be affected. Now, assignment, we'll talk about that in my video, but there are ways to circumvent this and I'm fully aware of it and, and I will, we, we don't take any trades based on that. I can actually show you our portfolio right now. This is not going to affect us in any way. So this is just, um, none, none of those count. These, these are all, um, none of these are on the list. There's basically a really long list of all the ETFs that are going to be affected by this and none of these qualify. VIXM is on the list. So we're going to, I'm probably going to add a little note down here saying that for anybody who is a non-US tax resident, you would probably want to default to VXZ. It's essentially materially identical to VIXM. It's just, this is an ETF and VXZ is an ETN. So I would do that. And then of course, in our vol trend strategy, we use UVXY and we use options. So it would not be subject. Now you might say, well, what happens if you get assigned? Well, first of all, it's super rare, almost never happens. But secondly, we could just go to VXX options. And then even if you do get assigned, it is an ETF and it doesn't matter anyway. And then our iron condor strategy will not be affected either. So basically that's a roundabout way of saying it doesn't really affect my community, but just as a call it a public service, I am gonna put some time into it 
put out a video explaining the whole situation for people. Um, like I said, it doesn't affect a whole number of people, but good information to get out there. And I, I certainly don't want anybody to get blindsided because a 10% withholding, it's not a 10% withholding on your profit. It's like they're going to take 10% of that. And if, let's say you were holding some options, and of course, options are much cheaper than the ETF itself. So you're holding a whole bunch of option contracts, and then you suddenly get assigned, the notional value on those assignment shares might actually be a whole lot more than you thought it was going to be. So I, I do need to just help people out, give them a heads up that uh, don't get yourself into any trouble with that. So thanks for that. That is coming. Only if they could use the powerful AI to come up with good trading recommendations. Well, I'm decent. I mean, maybe last year you probably were a little disappointed, but I'm pretty decent. I'll take on any computer out there. Open challenge to any AI program, at least for the next five or 10 years, I'll take them on. But yeah, there's going to be people that are writing AI trading programs and there's going to be people selling and marketing it like it's just this brilliant thing. The problem is they, so far, they have not been proven to have any success. And because it is AI and it, it's not just Google, it's actually learning and compiling things in real time. Sometimes when they, they go off the rails, the AI system doesn't know how to self-correct that. So you can actually get some really suddenly bad results when you're trusting your money with those. You, in my opinion, you still do need the human at the top of the pyramid making all the decisions. You can use the softwares, the AIs, and all those things to help your workflow. But it, there's, at least in the foreseeable future, they're not going to replace me. I, I will out-trade you know, these software programs that are based on AI or machine learning. I know it sounds cool and people buy into it and they're like, wow, I can just, I can just buy this thing and put it into my trading software and it does everything for me and it's just all automated. It is automated, but it could automate you right down to a 50% drawdown. So you gotta be very, very careful with convenience versus effectiveness. And I do not think the computers are nearly there yet. So <clears throat> title of this is volatility barometer. <laughs> Zero discussion so far, not trolling. Um, how long did I go on my presentation? I think I went long. I planned to do about 25 minutes, 20 to 25. I might have gone way over. I talk a lot. You know, I babble on. Um, but it's the question period. And plus, here I should show this to you. Fair point. I mean, you're right. We haven't talked a whole lot about volatility. But um, I do actually have a lot of segments planned. And in the future, we will... We will be very heavy. I, I plan to basically every episode, it's going to be volatility trading, options trading, investing stuff. There's going to be that topic and then the Q&A as well. But ask me anything. If you want to sort of steer this ship and get me back to where you want it to go, say so. And I don't consider that trolling. I Everybody who's on my live streams knows there's open door policy. Nobody, you can insult me flat out to my face if you want to. Uh, it's fine. What are your best strategies for dealing with large drawdowns psychologically? Particularly around the pain of a large loss from previous peak, as well as questioning one's skill and or strategies. This is, I mean, you've, you could write a book on, on that question. Basically, it's one of the most important things there is. That's why I made that previous video. Um, my assessment of last year was sort of alluding to this question that you're asking, that yeah, when you do suffer losses, and I think, I know I did, I, I think most people did, you have to make a genuine assessment. Okay, was this, was this, A, was this my fault? Or is, was it just a market that no matter what I did, it would not have worked? And then you have to make an assessment. Okay, let's say it is my fault. Should I change? Because last year was an outlier. So should you make that change? These are all decisions that, that every individual investor needs to make, that me as, an, as a manager needs to make. And this is really the, I would say your question there, arguably, is 
the biggest separating factor between why people should pay money for a good manager versus somebody trying to go it alone. If there is something in somebody's long history, and it's really hard to do live streams without plugging yourself. I'm not intending to do that, but just using myself as an example. If there is something in my 17 years of investing experience and all the ups and downs that I've gone through and all the losses that I've taken and all the mistakes that I've made, if there's something in there that allows me to self-correct a little bit faster than somebody else or a little bit more effectively than somebody else, there's no telling what that is worth. Now, on the flip side, if I make a mistake and I do it wrong, it could also derail and amplify further as well. So it obviously, it's very important to, to make that decision correctly because either direction, you're talking about something that could spiral either self-correct and everything's kind of okay in a year or two and you barely notice it. You know, when you look at long-term performance records, sometimes it looks really good, but you can't really focus in on what it would have felt like during that one blip. That on a long-term chart, it looks like just a blip. It looks like it's going upward in the right direction. I've got a track record that looks pretty, pretty solid, upward line. It's not Bernie Madoff. I do have losses. I do have bad years, but it's really good, right? But I remember what it was like in 2015. I remember August 2017. That hurt. That little, you know, 10% downtrend. I remember what that felt like and the uncertainty that I had around, boy, are my strategies broken? Like, what should I do? Should I fix this? And you just have to apply all of your knowledge and experience and make good decisions. So I have assessed everything. I usually do an annual audit of everything that I've done. And if necessary, I'll do semi-annual. But I have basically decided that I had about, you know, 13 strategies that I run actively and three of them didn't do well. And um, as, as bad as it sounds, and I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses, I have genuinely assessed that that was just par for the course. That's what you should have expected in a year where there was no asset classes doing well. And I don't want to optimize my portfolio for what if 2022 happens in 2023, because it probably won't. I mean, I can't see the future. It could happen exactly the same. And here we are in January 2024, and I'm saying, boy, that surprised me. It was, look at that. Every asset class was down again. That might happen. But the truth is, last year was an outlier. I know there's a lot of people in the investing world that are feeling the pain and really questioning what they're doing. And boy, like... Now what do I do? Everything I tried last year failed. Every time I made a slight correction, it was worse than it would have been otherwise. Every time I went this way, the market went that way, you know, it was rough. I would say for the majority of people, if possible, and financial loss is hard, if possible, try to forgive yourself for what happened. Try to move on and accept the fact that it's going to happen to you. If you're investing for 30 years, you're going to have four or five that you're just, oh, boy, I wish that didn't happen. And it's going to look like a blip on the long-term chart. You're going to feel it. But there's no, there's no way to quantifiably tell you that you're right or wrong, but just make good decisions. Allow yourself to make mistakes and forgive those mistakes. Because if you don't, you're going to end up making a bunch of changes that won't work this year because this year's market won't look like last year's. And then you, you might actually just double up on the problem. So um, if what you were doing before 2022 was working really well, in my opinion, don't fix it. It's probably not broken. That's it's the best I can do because honestly, it's, uh, it's nebulous. It's abstract. There's really no hard answers I can give you, but super, super important question there. So... Elon was an original investor. Not surprised. He, he's done a lot of great things. I like a lot of the stuff he's done. Just wish somebody would grab that stupid phone out of his hand and tell him to get back to what, get him, get him back to helping humanity. I don't care if he fixes Twitter or not. It, it will, from our perspective on the outside looking in, it will only ever look like the tiniest of improvement. It's not like it's going to revolutionize the world here. We're talking about 
sure he could clean up a couple of the censorship issues. Awesome. Then what? Got 15 other social media platforms that he can't clean up and it's just going to be drowned out anyway. So it's really not going to make a dent. I, I Smash Elon's phone. Tell him to get back to the stuff that matters. Loads of economic uncertainty with pressing question remains as this year Rory finally wins at Augusta. <laughs> it's talking about Rory McIlroy, golfer, winning the, uh, the Masters this year. Nope. I'm, I, I'm not a hater of Rory. Um, I think his game is phenomenal. Winning majors is statistically unlikely, and it doesn't matter how good you are. I mean, Rory wins, I don't know, twice a year. There's only four majors a year. He probably plays 22-ish, 20, 20 to 25 tournaments. No, he's statistically probably not. From I used to play professional golf, so I can kind of say this with a little bit of experience. But when you get to a certain level, there is not a whole lot of difference between one tournament and another tournament. They, all of us were very mentally strong back then. Like there, there was no added pressure. Wow, this is the masters. No, from the outside looking in, for most people, they think it's just infinitely harder to win at the masters than it is to win at the greater Greensboro classic, you know, some low level tournament or whatever. Yeah, maybe because the field's really strong, but as far as winning majors, I know that's the benchmark for history and Jack Nicholas won 18 and Tiger only won 15. So therefore Jack's the goat and Tiger isn't. These types of comparisons are irrelevant because Tiger is equally focused in every tournament he plays. So was Jack. It's just a statistical anomaly, right? You know, Nick Faldo had six of them. Greg Norman had two of them. But Greg Norman was number one world ranking for 331 weeks in a row. Nick Faldo was, what, 70? You know, things like this. Patrick Harrington has three majors and Greg Norman has two. I mean, come on. So, no, I wouldn't judge um, based on the majors. I think if Rory just keeps winning, he is basically the world number one. And that's all that really matters. Statistically speaking, no. I mean, there's only four of them a year, and he's probably only going to win twice next year, and it's probably not going to be a major. So he might be stuck where he's at. He might get one more, but he's not going to get 15 like Tiger. Um, that's just what I think. Plus, I'm just livid with some of Rory's comments about the live golf players. Stay out of people's business. If somebody wants to sign a contract with the Live Golf Foundation and make a bunch of money for their family and their kids, and well, what is it anyone else's business, what they do? You know, you don't have to grandstand every single time there's a microphone in your face telling you, oh, I wouldn't do that. I'm in it for legacy and I'm in it for trophies. And look at these losers. They're just doing it for money. Maybe, but Dustin Johnson made $160 million last year. So maybe let the guy earn for his family. He made his own decision, right? Cameron Smith made his own decision. Let him do it. You don't have to comment. So I was disappointed to hear Rory just for a whole year straight, just grandstanding against Liv. Don't go, but that's it. Leave it there. Don't go. Stay there. They go there. Everybody's happy. I'm not one for budding in people's business and their personal decisions that they make. All I can say is what I would do. That's it. I, I don't want to be the person that tells anybody else what to do. So I, I think Rory's a little bit of a spoiled brat, to be honest. But he is the best golfer in the world at, at the moment. So I don't know. Maybe he wins the Masters. When holding long positions in any of the three leveraged total portfolio strategies, stocks are in the money calls, do you ever consider selling out-of-the-money short-term calls against those positions for hedging? No, we don't. Because... I've done a couple of videos in the past about why covered calls is actually a really terrible strategy. And the gist of it is essentially you're limiting your potential profit, but you're not reducing the losses. You're not adding any risk management. A, an out of the money covered call when volatility is low and the market is slowly creeping higher, those premiums are going to be so low that if you want to get any premium that's meaningful to your portfolio, you have to go pretty close to the money. And that's going to be risking losing the position. I never know how long we're going to be in those positions. So essentially, what we're in right now, right? We're in the XLU. I, I know some of these thresholds look like they're tight, but we could potentially be in... We were in this position for months in a row, months straight. We were in this range right here in the strategic leverage 
for several months in a row. So the thing is, you, you never really know how long you're going to be able to ride a trend. Once you get into the good range, the green range here, the green here, the green here, that could be riding pretty well. Like it's easier to talk about with volatility ETP strategies, but my tactical volatility strategy that is currently not in the portfolio because two times equity ETFs are just more efficient in the last couple of years. Volatility is not behaving normally. So I kind of removed that one. It'll come back. But I had one position that made 120% without exiting the position. It just, we entered it, wrote it for months, volatility decayed, made 120% in that position by the time we actually exited back to cash. Now, if you're in the habit, and let's say it was a two times equities ETF, it would have made what, 40, 50, something like that. If you're in the habit of selling covered calls, you're cutting off your tops, but you're not reducing your downside risk. Those pennies that you collect, okay, the stock crashes on you and you lost 16 cents less than the person who had the, that didn't have the covered call. It just doesn't make any sense. Covered calls is one of those things that in my opinion, it sells well, it, it sounds great. It's, it, you know, you can talk about income trading and generating monthly income. It's all kinds of ways you could design courses around it. You could charge a thousand dollars to tell people it's so easy. I'll just sell covered calls because I'm holding the stock anyway. Why not rent it out to other people? I could build a course right now telling people how to sell covered calls. But at the end of the day, it doesn't improve your portfolio performance. It actually hurts the performance. So um, buy my course, covered calls, best thing in the world, $1,000 to me. And then your portfolio suffers for it. So no, I wouldn't do that. Um, essentially, no, we just let those positions ride. And the only time we exit them or change them in any way is if the volatility metrics move into a different range. That's basically our entry and exit trigger. That's all we could do. I do not know if I'm going to be holding that two times NASDAQ index for a week and it's going to lose 10% or whether I'm going to hold it for a month and every one of those covered calls is going to be breached along the way. I have no idea. Aaron, I think the ES futures had the most amount of 1% or greater days ever. Up or down? I think it was third, second, very close. Um, and the only reason I know that, I mean, you might be right, but the only reason I know that is because I think about a week ago, there's a guy on Twitter, I'll butcher his last name, Charlie Biello, something like that. Um, sounds like that. Don't want to butcher his name. I wish I knew it because his it's he's a good follow. Um, he posted a chart, literally this exact thing, and I actually remember him saying that it was like the second, but it was super close, and we were almost there. So you could be right. I mean, it was it was one of the choppiest years on record. And like I showed in my video, if um, you know, not many people watched it, but I showed the data that look the S and P five hundred. I'll just do charts because they're easier to see. S&P 500 has its third worst year in, in our lifetimes, right? That's bad. But diversified investors, bonds had their worst year in history. So if you're talking about a 60-40 portfolio, it was diabolical last year. This was way worse than the financial crisis. It was way worse than the dot-com bust. And then, of course, if you factor in gold, probably people who are into gold would have wanted it to perform super good because t last year was terrible. And if gold can't perform well when inflation is off the charts and the Fed is doing insane measures and the world's falling apart, if gold is still down 1%, that's not a very good sign, is it? But then, of course, a 50-30-20 using gold, by far the worst ever. So, um, you know, typically you can see the numbers here. If you go to the dot-com bust, the, the, most of the dip was here. Gold was up 25.5% in 2002. So... Sure, stock sucked and a lot of people lost a lot of money, but you know there were other asset classes. In 2008 financial crisis, stocks were the worst we've had in our lifetime, down 36, but the TLT was up 34%. So if you're a diversified investor, you wouldn't have felt it quite as bad as 2022. That was the worst year we've ever seen where stocks got destroyed, not quite as bad as dot-com bust, but bad, and then treasuries, worst year ever. So... Most of the world follows as roughly 60-40. It was, it was as bad as it gets. So I would not be surprised if you're right or whether it's just barely outside. Um, 
Oh, my sister's on. Hey, cool. Thank you for tuning in. I don't know what time it is for you, but it's 2.20 in the morning for me here in Taiwan. So uh, I'll be heading, heading out to a new location next week, secret location. Some of you know where I'm going, but um, yeah, I'll be live streaming with a different view next week. So tune in to that for sure. <clears throat> so I've been going for an hour 20. I promised myself this year I would cut them at an hour and just do more streams rather than typically we would quite regularly go for two hours. I've had three hour streams where I just lightning around answer questions for two and a half hours, but um, I should probably cut them to an hour. And then if I have to double up streams in a week, I, I should do that because I'm boring as it is. Um, I'm, this is not thrilling content for anybody, but how many people have two hours to dedicate to listening to to this guy ramble on. So I highlighted it. I'm going to answer it. I find when trading the iron condor strategy that when price moves far enough away from one side of the condor and the spread can be bought back for 10 cents or less, <clears throat> then it improves the chances of win, especially when the price reverses and moves back towards said spread. And sometimes, okay, I, I know the gist of this one. So let's, uh, let's go through what DK here, that's the rundown. Nope, that's not good. Not now. Recent videos. Okay. Screen share disappear. No, no, there it is. Okay. You can, you can tell I haven't done this in a while. So I'll just highlight one of the iron condors that we currently have open <clears throat> in our portfolio. Actually, maybe I'll use the cues just because I always show the spy. So um, one of these is a calendar. So I will delete the calendar. This is the iron condor that we currently have open. Let me try to clean this up a little bit. Uh, there you go. So what our friend DK here is saying is right now the price is in the middle. This over here is a short put spread. So you can see it down here. This is the short 235, 230 put spread. And this is a short call spread. Essentially it is two vertical spreads put together in the same trade. It's all done in one transaction. So these are not hard to trade. It, for people new to trading, this might look confusing because look at all those contracts. No, this is actually extremely easy to do. But the price is in the middle right now. So it's quite a profitable trade. If it stays here, great. We're going to close it out and take our money. What he's saying is, let's say the price starts heading down here. What's going to end up happening is this put spread is going to get really expensive. And this call spread is basically going to approach full profit. And so what you could do is basically the standard iron condor adjustment is when it gets towards this direction, when you feel like you've made enough money on this side, you could close it out, like you said, for 10 cents or 15 cents. And then now you've just got a short put spread. Vice versa the other way. If it goes up this way, this one's going to get really cheap, almost zero. Since these are short vertical spreads, you want the price to go down. So maybe you sold it for a dollar and it goes down to 10 cents. You basically collected 90 cents of your profit. Now, the reason that I don't do this, this is actually reminding me, I should probably put a full video out um, in the Iron Condor course. For those that don't know, if you join the VTS community, you do get access to a full Iron Condor course. And I'll just keep adding courses and lessons. So that's just a benefit of joining the community. You can sign up for the free trial, free plug. There's what, 40 of you watching this. Um, there is a free trial and you can see the course there for free as well. So um, iron condors are supposed to be a market neutral, delta neutral position. I've never liked the idea. And first of all, I used to test that a lot. I've been trading iron condors for well over 10 years. I used to test everything and my results were different. I, I got worse results doing those adjustments, but just logically, why would you take a direction neutral trade and then make it a strong directional trade, but not because you wanted to, not because you had a trade thesis that would lead you in that direction, but because the market pushed you there. I would never let the market dictate my strategies like that. I, I set the iron condor up with a trade thesis on day one. This is where the price is gonna stay. I've got a stop loss and a stop gain. And that's my trading plan. If the market does something unexpected, 
I don't want that market to force me into positions that weren't mine. I didn't want to be directional. If you, if you have that short put, and what some people do is they take some of the margin requirement that is now relieved because you've sold one side and they actually double it up on the other side. So now you've taken a double strongly directional position when that's not part of the strategy. I've got other strategies in my portfolio that are, are now not going to function correctly because I've, I've skewed my directional bias. So what I do instead is I just honor my stop losses or my stop gains and I layer trades. So if the, if the price deviates more than say, our rule is about 4%. If it goes down somewhere around here, maybe here, instead of doing all that adjusting, I don't want to call it nonsense because that's your strategy. I don't want to belittle your strategy, but doing all those adjustments, I'll just add another trade that's centered around the new price that's shifted away. No need to open a new trade here when it's in the middle. That would just be doubling up on something I've already got. But if it does deviate far enough, I've got up to three positions to take. There's two listed here, but you could do up to five if you wanted. These are very small allocations. And it's much better long term to just start layering trades. Because if it does go down, I don't know if it's going to come back the next day. I have no idea it might come back into the full range again and I'll take more profit. I would rather market neutral here, market neutral here, maybe one over here as the price is moving around, maybe switch it up between the NASDAQ, do one on the on treasuries, do one on gold or whatever. You could have an entire portfolio of iron condors, small allocations, all delta neutral in the first day, layered upon layered and then just let the market move around. Now you've got a diversified portfolio of options that are short Vega. So you're gonna profit, they're, they're theta positive trades, so you're gonna benefit each day. That is a much better strategy. And I personally get way better results doing that. Again, I don't wanna belittle people that do this, but that adjustment stuff that people will sort of teach you how to do, it sells great, but it doesn't actually improve results. It reduces performance. But it sounds awesome. It sounds like the, the most logical thing to do. And again, I could give me a week, I could package a course together and I could sell it to you for $4.99. Get buy my course now, quick, get your credit card. But um, practically speaking, no, you just want to layer as many trades as possible and you want to honor your stops and um, let the profit come through time without allowing the market to push you in certain directions just because something unexpected happens. That's what I would say. But I, I, could, I could clean that whole thing way up if I just did a video explaining it. So maybe I'll do that. Thanks for the suggestion. Could you do a brief recap of your thought process behind over allocation to QLD early in 2022? Um, it actually had very little to do with QLD. Um, well, the one thing is the strategy was up, I think, top of my head, 55% or something the year before. So it was our top performing strategy. So maybe that creeped into my head a little bit. Essentially what he's saying is I increased it from 20 to 40% at the end of last year. And of course that turned out to be a bad mistake because the NASDAQ was down more last year than any other index, right? The Dow wasn't down that much. The S&P was down 18, but the Qs, the, the NASDAQ was down the most. So for, I can't even remember, I think February 14th or something, we scrapped that idea and went back to the 20% allocation. But there was a good six weeks there where it actually was costly. But it wasn't specifically because of the queues. So essentially what it was, was I didn't want my portfolio, um, the, the safety positions is essentially what I was doing. I I was looking at the landscape and the fact that the markets could be suffering and I basically wanted an over allocation in what I thought was good safety positions. And it turned out to be okay, but you know, we didn't know that volatility would would stay in those middle levels. Essentially what happened is for the volatility barometer, I've, you know, for 12, 13 years or whatever since I've been using something like this, you can pretty reliably count on volatility kicking you out of the aggressive positions and into something safe fairly quickly, within a day or two, maybe three days on the high end. 
we were in a situation last year where volatility was just, it was moving very slowly and it was muted. And we talked about this a lot. So that decision, oh, everything just went black. I'm going to assume everybody's still here and keep talking. Um, that decision wasn't actually because, hey, let's over allocate to the queues. Not entirely. Maybe, you know, humans, sometimes they think, wow, it was up 50 whatever percent. Maybe we should just over allocate. It wasn't actually like that. I was... I was trying to weigh the safety positions of the portfolio and thinking that if I over allocate to that, well, volatility is going to kick me out anyway, and it's going to move me into the XLU, which I actually wanted to be in more often and further than that, maybe cash. So we just got in a position where a lot of those QLD losses we were taking were happening because volatility stayed in a pretty low band. And we were in those two times NASDAQ positions too long. Um, historically speaking, every other year they were much more responsive uh, volatility moves. So it was, couldn't have seen it coming ahead of time. Nobody has a crystal ball. It just, volatility didn't behave well last year. Safety positions didn't behave well. Equities behaved terribly. Bonds had their worst year ever. Ah, there's a very fine line between making excuses and providing answers. And I, I hope I'm not sounding like I'm making excuses. I'm always a person who owns up to everything and just lays it out for you because nothing changes on my end, right? If Whether I have a thousand people in the community or zero, my investing remains identical. Everything that I do, everything you see in the emails, that's my portfolio. So it doesn't really matter how many people follow, how many people believe me, how many people don't. I'm still doing the same thing tomorrow, no matter what. So I don't ever feel that need to come on and defend myself and make excuses and no, you know, I'm just providing answers. So hopefully it doesn't sound like that, but that's what happened. It was a mistake. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have ever broken my personal rule. I think I wrote an article, um, top three mistakes that I made. And that was one of them that I talked about that don't ever over allocate to a, a strategy, even if my reasoning was actually quite sound and it wasn't because of the cues, <clears throat> it was because of safety. Still, don't ever, ever over allocate. That's, that's a rule. It's a hard rule. Bad things happen when you break your trading rules. And um, I broke my rule and it, it cost us six weeks of additional frustration. So <clears throat> I was able to fix it, but... Uh, the last 10 months, it was, wasn't was like great. I'm not going to high five or anything, but it um, wasn't that bad, relatively speaking. And I wish pe more people could participate in options. There's a lot of people who are just aren't interested. And, but I'm telling you, just it's such, a, it's such a good portfolio diversifier, especially the way that I trade options. They're not the directional garbage that you see. We're not doing you know, YOLO AMC calls or anything. My options trading is very centered around, you know, boosting the diversification of my existing portfolio, which is trend following. So I don't need more trend following. I don't need my, my option strategies to be buying calls on Apple. It's not going to do anything for me. I'm already in the Dow, the SPY, the NASDAQ. I don't need more Apple stock. So my option strategy is to reinforce the middle where there is weakness there because trend following what happens if there's no trend you get chopped around and you know you, you can actually lose money when the market's not losing money that's the weakness of trend following so my option strategy is like plugging that hole and making sure that if the market is choppy and garbage that i've got several strategies that are doing well and so you know vix options iron condors were up 25% Fall trend, 11, my earnings trades did great, while the other ones aren't. That's the point. Uh, you do not want, if I was a typical option trader that just does YOLO puts and calls and tries to go for it, last year would have been an absolute disaster for me because trend following was already bad. And then you're just going to double up on even worse by taking directional option trades. So it's not what I do. I don't, I just wish more people could. Partially my fault. I didn't make it available because I just, I'm a one man show here and I, I just got extremely busy and I had to make it, make a call. So I temporarily put it on hold, but believe me, I'm working crazy hours to try to get the options trading up and running. So, uh, 
<clears throat> one more question, and then we gotta go. I didn't turn the air conditioning on tonight. I'm getting actually pretty hot. What careers do you think would be best to work towards in 10 to 20 years, <clears throat> given the rapid advancement of AI? Hmm. Careers. Well, of course, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship and more specifically solopreneurship, where I am a one-man show here at BTS. And I could hire some help and stuff, but and I probably will. Video editing is not my thing. I could hire, I could outsource that. But anything that you can do that um, doesn't cost money up front, don't ever, well, I don't, I don't want to say don't ever. Maybe you've got a brilliant idea, but <clears throat> be very wary of dumping money into a business on the front end. Be wary of taking on debt to start a business. But you should start something. Now, the, the thing is, Brian... Every single thing you do, this is something that I, I tell people all the time. First of all, you have to know that I, I, my whole life, golf tournaments, I used to win all the tournaments, but my biggest fear was not winning the tournament. It wasn't being nervous on the, the 18th green, putting for the win. I can make that putt. I was nervous about the speech afterwards. I was terrified of public speaking. I would intentionally lose tournaments. I told this story in the past, but I intentionally lost four or five tournaments before I finally accidentally lost a tournament. The guy that I was playing against, 17 years old, I was playing the uh, City Club Champions Tournament. So everybody who's won a tournament gets to play that tournament. And I had a two-stroke lead. I was going to win this thing, and I fully planned to butcher it. And I did. I intentionally kind of fired it into the trees and whatnot. And the guy made a triple bogey, and uh, I ended up winning the tournament. And I did a speech and I was terrified. I remember, I, I don't remember a thing, but afterwards I sat down, I somehow made it back to my seat and I sat down and everybody told me, oh, that wasn't that bad. You know, they, I think at the time they said, I'm a 12 handicap. If you're a golfer, 12 is kind of decent, but it's not great. They said, you're a scratch golfer on the golf course and you're a 12 handicap on the speeches. So that was the first time I kind of did it. And then, you know, I stopped throwing tournaments intentionally and I started making speeches. But the point of me telling you this is no matter what you do in the future, you are going to have to engage with social media. You're going to have to build your personal brand. If you want to have success in the future, it's going to be one of those things kind of like, can you imagine somebody not going to university in 1980? That's a statement. That's a bold, wow, you're not going to get a degree? Really? Are you sure? Because the statistically speaking, if you don't have a degree, I mean, what if you're a high school dropout? I mean, that's going to be difficult. I think social media, ability to be on camera, ability to run a podcast, you're going to have to do it. So whatever you do, you're going to have to jump in. You're going to have to go on social media. So maybe I'm talking nonsense here and you've already got your Twitter accounts and you've already got a newsletter that you're building. But that's what I would say. Anything that you can do on your own, help people out. Basic rules of business is pretty simple. Identify a problem and fix it, right? Identify a pain point for a lar hopefully a large number of people and solve it for them, right? Investing. <clears throat> Why does my business work so well? Well, first of all, I'm really good at it. I work very hard. But also, is there a bigger problem in the world than people not having enough money? I mean, it's really one of the biggest pain points for people. It's just financial industry has been letting people down for decades. They're just collecting these massive fees and they're not making any return for anybody. They're underperforming their benchmark. 85% of people that you pay 1% of your assets to are losing money compared to a buy and hold 60-40. Are you kidding me? So I saw that and I'm like, I'm way better than that. Why don't I just start sharing my work? If I didn't jump on YouTube, if I didn't write a thousand articles, if I didn't do all these things, I'd still be the exact same investor. Like I said, my portfolio doesn't change whether you're watching my stream or not. I do the same thing tomorrow, but nobody would have known I existed. So step one, I don't care if you don't have a job right now, you're saying the next 10 or 20 years, 
I don't care if you're unemployed, start a YouTube channel, build a website, make sure that you've got a .com website, make sure that you know how to write, dedicate yourself every week to writing an article, pick a subject, selling real estate, awesome. I don't care if you don't even own a home. Pick a subject, write one article a week, make a video per week, start a podcast, zero people will be watching it. Send me the link, I, there will be one person watching your podcast, me. But that's what you do. And what you're gonna find is, in one year, you might be an awesome real estate business owner. Or you might hate real estate, you know nothing, and nobody tuned in. But in the meantime, you learned how to speak on camera. You learned how to build a website. You learned how to put yourself out there. You probably learned some video editing skills. You probably went out and learned some technical stuff. Shure SM7B microphone. How do I know that? I have known nothing, but I had to do this to build my business. You're gonna learn SEO. You're gonna learn, hopefully, chat GPT marketing on the AI front. You're gonna have an entire skill set that was based on that. You're gonna look back, you're gonna have 52 articles, 52 videos, a newsletter, a podcast, and a website. One year from today. Why not? It does not matter if nobody watches. Nobody watched my first year either. But now you're on my stream asking me for my advice on business stuff. I've never even shared my business ventures. I've never, I don't, I'm not that guy. I don't talk about any of that stuff. But you're doing that because I built this. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified when I first started. And you're going to have imposter syndrome and you're going to feel like I'm, I'm talking to nobody. And even if somebody's listening, why would they listen to me? I don't have any experience. You're going to feel all of that. But trust me, in a year from now, it's either going to be the right direction or you will have built an entire set of skills that will take you in the right direction. So that's what I would tell you is it doesn't matter. Start when you're not ready. You have, you have to start when you're not ready. The biggest problem I see with people is that they plan and plan and they watch videos and watch tutorials and they, they've got all these schemes and oh, I just need a few more. And wow, that guy's got a great idea. Start when you're totally unprepared and then make adjustments along the way. That's what I would say. And of course I'll help. I mean, I'm not uh, withholding any information from anybody. You're not a threat to me. If you have any questions, ask me anything you want about how I write, my workflow, all that stuff. Feel free. <clears throat> but um, as far as specific to AI everything. This is a game changer. What happened this year, and it's been building for a while, but literally the launch of a chat-based AI I mean, that anybody can use, it's ridiculous. Ascent, oh, what is that called? Mastodon? Um, a lot of Twitter people say they're going to a new platform called Mastodon. So I was like, oh, great. I, I'm always looking forward to the next social media thing. I'm, I'm willing to try anything, right? Mastodon requires a pretty high level of knowledge, like Maybe for other people, it seems basic, but for an old guy like me, it seemed like it required programming. It required like you have to set up your own server. No, it's just, I'm not going to do that. And most people are not going to do that. Chat GPT, what you're telling me, I can just pretend that there's a face in front of me and I can just talk to it. Total game changer. So literally everything. It's not AI specific. It doesn't have to be. Musicians will use AI just as much as lawyers. Lawyers will use it for different purposes. They will help answer client questions. They will have a database of answers at their fingertips. They'll be able to write stuff. Musicians will use it to create new music, to create new stuff. Um, salespeople will use it for all kinds of reasons. AI will be equally, roughly equally useful for everybody in the world. Get used to it. There is a use for it. So pick an industry that you're interested in and go for it and uh, send us all the links so you don't feel like you're um, talking to <laughs> no people because that's what's going to happen. I mean, imagine when I wrote my first article, when I made my first video, you think anybody watched it? No. Probably still to this day, I should look back at the views, probably 100 views or something. So hopefully I gave you a little bit of encouragement there to... I don't know. Stop planning. Stop questioning. Don't 
not don't ask guys like me. I want you to ask. If you have questions, ask. But my overall point is you don't need to ask. You already know the answer. I know you know the answer. So just do it. Everybody in the stream, every single one of you has an idea that will work if you execute. 95% of people in the world, old, young, and everything in between, have all the planning skills in the world. We all have great ideas. We're all smart. Very few people have execution skills. You have an idea, the proverbial you, not you, Brian, but all, you know, millions of people out there, you're not going to do it. I know you're not going to do it. And that's why I'm going to beat you because I am going to do it. So people like me who just say, I'm not ready at all. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Those people are the ones that five years from now, you look at them and you think, wow, how did they start that amazing business? Well, they woke up the next day and did what you didn't want to do or you refused to do or didn't have the dedication to do. So it's really it. I mean, the difference between that millionaire with his solopreneurship business is essentially execution. That's what it is. Um, yeah. Execute. If it's in your head, do it. What do you got to lose? You'll learn 10 skills along the way to failure. Your website will crash and burn. Your YouTube channel will get no viewers and you will be way further ahead in your career having those failures than you are today. So we should cap. I, I did it again. Look, hour and 46. I can't stop talking. <laughs> I don't know why people aren't yelling at me. Okay, enough, enough. Come back next week. There's, there's more time. You can come back next Tuesday. It's fine. Um, let's, let's call it a day. There's one more question here. I'm just so interested in what everybody is saying. And I just, I don't get out much. I don't talk much. I don't really have many friends. So this is great for me. I love this. Nobody tried to get me canceled today. Nobody asked me about religion. Nobody asked me about, um, you know, what I think about Andrew Tate. Nobody asked me any tough questions. It just all cool stuff. AI is revolutionary as electricity in the computer. Yeah, it, it very well could be. I agree with you. Like I said, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly because we're in it, but I would not be surprised at all if looking back from this, that it's actually internet-ish level of achievement, um, especially, like I said, in the form that it came in. That's important. Some idiot like me with no programming skills can use this tool? Are you kidding me? With no training? None at all. I can just... My wife, I told her about it today. She had no idea this existed. And she speaks Chinese. She, I went out to work. I went out to Starbucks. She was still talking to chat GPT. She's like, this is great. I can, she's working on her sommelier. She's trying to go up the ranks of, uh, you know, wine tasting. And she was asking it all kinds of wine questions. And hey, hey, chat GPT, plan out a 10 city tour around France. What are the highlights? It was awesome. She has less than me computer skills. And she was all over it. So it's not just the achievement that AI is. It's the accessible form that it it is now there. Uh, incredible. There's also one, it's called Dolly, where D-A-L-L dot E, where it's basically an AI. It's the same company, but it's more image related. So you can say, you know, my cat's down here. You can't see her because I'm on a standing desk. She usually sits right next to me, but I could type into Dolly, create a picture for me of a white cat sleeping on a chair and five or six pictures will show up. And then you can say, make her standing instead. And then four pictures of a standing white cat, um, turn it into a impressionist Picasso style. And it'll spit out four images of, you know, like it's a cat on, sleeping on a chair, but it's like loopy Picasso looking things, you know, starry night kind of thing. Unbelievable. And, um, anybody can use it. It's crazy. It blows my mind. I don't know for a, a non-technical person like me to be this into it, I think this changed the world. It really did. I'm, I'm super excited. I'm scared because I know this gets back to our friend Brian here. I know there is a hundred million people in the world right now 
that know way more about this than I do. And that scares me a little bit because I don't really know those things. But listen to my, listen to me talk about it. I have zero programming skills, got nothing at all. I don't know anything about AI. I couldn't even open a Mastodon account. But I'm going in on this because I'm going to execute. So if this is any lesson to you, listen to a, a bumbling computer idiot tell you about AI and how revolutionary it is and how I'm going to be actively seeking out ways that it can enhance my business. Even though I know that it still requires me, it still requires my brain and my planning and my strategies and nobody can do this but me. It's, it's my solopreneurship business based on my strategies. But I'm going all in to see if it can help something. So you, you, maybe you should do that. It'll only take you a month of really dedicated work to be better than 95% of the world at AI. Another six months after that, you're top 99, you're top 1%. A year after that, you've basically, maybe two years after that, you've got your 10,000 hours. So you asked a question, what should you do in AI? You should start today, learn everything you can about it, open a website, YouTube channel, start writing articles, creating videos, and two years from now, you will have a course teaching people how to use AI to their specific business. You will teach lawyers how to use chat GPT or whatever the new thing is then, how to do this. And you can also teach, you, you can show a teacher who teaches fifth grade whatever, French, Canadian, I, I think I took French in grade five. Um, teach them how to use AI. Teach everybody in any specific field how to use AI. Old people like me, we need your help. I'm not gonna do this on my own. I, I can't create anything like that. There's your business idea. It's not only AI, it's literally about AI. That's your course. Start a, start a newsletter, start putting names on it. Tweet 10 times a day. Trust me, a year from now, you'll be, in, you'll be a top one percenter AI expert in one year because your competition in this world, and I don't mean to belittle people, but your competition, it's a low bar. I mean, it, it's a low bar. There, there are not that many people that are truly dedicated. The vast majority of people, they work their 35 hours and the weekend is the weekend, right? A weekend means nothing to me. Saturday night means nothing like a Tuesday morning. It's just, I've, I've been, I, when I was a pro golfer and I was a full-time student as well, and I was managing a professional golf career and two majors in university at the same time, I didn't have a Saturday night. There was, what does that mean? I, I have work to do. If I'm, if I'm not in school, I'm on the golf course. And if I'm not there, I'm in the gym. And if I'm not there, then I'm doing something else to forward my business. Do that for two years and I, you won't even believe how far ahead you are of these people that you're competing against. Again, not belittling anybody. If you if you do want just the, the normal like nine to five type, that's awesome, good for you. I'm just saying that uh, <laughs> you, you can beat these people, you really can. Everybody can. So I'll leave it there. That was fun though, I like this. I, I really like live streaming. I hate it in the first 30 minutes. I'm super scared and nervous, and but uh, I like having a community that asks good questions. Like I said, you're, you're among my only friends. So uh, tune in next week and entertain me and I'll answer some questions back. So uh, thanks everybody for signing up or showing up. Good night. It's actually three o'clock in the morning here for me, so I should probably go to bed. All right, take it easy.